Hi, I'm Tim Jordan, and at every corner of the world, entrepreneurship is growing. So join me as I explore the stories of successes and failures. Listen in as I chat with the risk takers, the adventurous, and the entrepreneurial veterans. We all have a dream of living a life fulfilling our passions, and we want a business that doesn't make us punch a time clock, but instead runs around the clock in the AM and the PM. So get motivated, get inspired. You're listening to the AM PM podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the AM PM podcast. Today, we are going to be interviewing Susanna, or I'm going to be interviewing Susanna, and we're going to be talking a lot about Latin America. And this is a pretty big subject. We can't go into all the, uh, you know, all the different quadrants that this conversation get into. But we're going to be talking specifically about utilizing Latin American suppliers to potentially build your products, right? Like, how do we utilize this amazing culture, uh, this amazing opportunity for production, while also understanding the limits and understanding some cultural differences we might not be aware of, all that good stuff. And I'm going to warn everybody, Susanna is not a gringo. Susanna is uh, Spanish born. She was born in Costa Rica, and she has a little bit of a Spanish accent. And when you combine her Spanish accent with my like ability to understand an Alabamian accent, uh, it's a little tough for me sometimes. So I told her, I said, Susanna, like when we get started on this thing, like I need to speak really clearly. And she's like, no problem. I speak in, that's my Italian accent, not even my Spanish accent. Anyway, she used a Spanish accent. She said, I'll just speak in Spanish. And I was like, well, that'd be great, except uh, it's kind of hard to carry in a conversation because I don't know Spanish. So long story short, uh, forgive us when you combine both of these exotic accents. Uh, we're going to do our best to keep it as clear as possible. So Susanna, thank you for being here. How are you today? Great, uh, Tim. Thank you for having me. And great. It's, it's really hot here. <laughs> yep. You're in Texas now, um, which is still kind of Latin America when you think about it, right? Like with the Spanish population being that high there. So uh, whether you're living in Mexico, Texas, or Costa Rica, it's probably uh, very similar in a lot of ways. So uh, if you would briefly, Susanna, kind of introduce yourself and tell us just the brief story of how you ended up on this podcast being asked to speak about Latin American sourcing. We already know that you're from Costa Rica originally. You live in Texas right now. Uh, you've done some business coaching. You've done some sourcing. Like, Give us the five-minute rundown. Like you mentioned, I was in Costa Rica. I moved to, to Mexico, and I start um, coaching people there. Um, and some friends start asking me to help them in their business to coach the, their salespeople, right? So uh, I start doing that, and I start like seeing some um, some things on the purchase uh, uh, part because they were uh, buying like too expensive or from like manuf other manufacturers uh, like the same way. 50 years, 30 years ago. So they they didn't have like this cap capability to understand that if if you lower your cost, you know, you can buy to others, you can uh, ask them for better prices and everything. So I start doing that like uh, as a procurement uh, person, right? So uh, with one of the companies, uh, they asked me to move to the United States to help them uh, to develop the brand or the, they manufacture auto parts. So uh, I moved here and I start, I start helping them and trying to figure it out, uh, a way to do it, to help them more. I start putting ads <laughs> saying Mexico, the next China. Imagine that. Uh, so it, it was cool because I start getting like all this, uh, people asking me, can you find me a pre-work couch shake or things like that? And I was like, oh my God, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. But I start contacting, uh, some of my friends and, and I start helping them to get source of those kind of products. Right. So, um, that's how I realized that private labeling exists because I didn't know. I thought it was just, I thought Amazon, it was just a big website where all the um, brands put their products and that was it. But I didn't imagine that it was like regular people trying to do business there 
and and sourcing the products from different uh, manufacturers and putting their uh, their brand there, right? So it was super cool for me because I started like digging and digging more into this information, and and I start realizing that it how come it's just China, you know, or mostly China? Because everybody told me like. Susana, I need to source this from other places because China is not working uh, for me. And this was before COVID, you know, and it, it, I started like trying to help them. And then COVID came and it was like, boom, thousands of emails. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I started telling people, you know what? I'm like the Alibaba manually for Latin America because I was like bombarded with with emails about, I need this, I need that. Uh, these people in China are not shipping stuff and I'm uh, running out of um, inventory and things like that. And I was like, so I, I had to immerse myself in the information about this. And I saw the um, some videos of how to sell on Amazon. And, and I start to understand uh, how people do this. Uh, so that's that's why I I started in all this. I know you uh, you know prior to this meeting I know that you were actually involved in you working as a, a as a consultant procurement agent for several manufacturers in Latin America. Like you've got pretty big history there, and I know you've you've elaborated more on the recent developments of connecting the the capabilities of production in Latin America with the demand essentially, whether it's just organic raw demand, or if it's created by the the duties and, and trade war going on with the U.S. last year, and you know the the slow shipping times due to COVID and all that stuff. So I know that you've been a business coach. I know you've worked in manufacturing, and I know that now you are uh, involved in e-commerce. And you didn't mention it, but I'm gonna brag on you a little bit. You actually are uh, part owner, or co-founder, or something of at least a couple brands that are selling online right now, which uh, I've seen and are both really cool products. So congrats. That's uh, that's really really cool. So, so now that you understand a little bit about the needs of e-commerce sellers, right? Like we don't have humongous procurement teams. We don't, you know, we're not generally placing, you know, three year contract orders of 200 containers of the same product. We have to be nimble, but that gives us opportunities to find unique products. And you and I have discussed this before, but I'll, I'll tell it to the audience. Like I was interested in Latin American sourcing probably four years ago. I... Uh, through my company, Hickory Flats, actually had a sourcing arm in Guatemala. We initially tried in Honduras. The infrastructure wasn't, you know, developed enough. So we set up in Guatemala City. We were sourcing products for different brands, for e-commerce sellers. We were actually taking trips down there. And there were a lot of things that I loved about sourcing in Latin America. And there were a lot of things that I absolutely hated about sourcing in Latin America. And a lot of it, a lot of the things that I hated were initially based on lack of education that I had, like it was naivety, it was ignorance, things that I had to learn kind of the hard way. And a lot of those things, uh, you know, I had to learn pretty quickly, but ended up being pretty big stumbling blocks to continue that sector of business. And you and I have talked extensively about different regions within Latin America, like we're talking about Latin America as, as a whole, but doing business in Guatemala and sourcing Guatemala is very different than in Mexico and is very different in Colombia and very different than in Argentina. And I know that you have experience basically across all of Latin America and you have a good sampling of that. So what I'd like to do is start with the general understanding of like the things that I know, like the, like the difficulties and the struggles that I had. And I'd like to continue learning more about sourcing in Latin America as it pertains to an ongoing opportunity, right? So basically what I wanna do is I wanna have a conversation with you. Uh, about some of those things that I noticed, and you can kind of elaborate and understand, uh, help me understand some of those things I noticed maybe, but also share with our listeners more information on who, where, when, why, what, like why, when, where they should be using Latin America as a sourcing opportunity, and some of the biggest misconceptions people have as well. Cool? So the first thing I want to jump into is limited products, all right? And I'm going to tell you my perception, and then you can correct me, uh, especially in Central America, in you know Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. Um, there's not a lot of heavy industry that's accessible, 
right? There are essentially sweatshops that are built up by largely South Korean companies, is my understanding. But, you know, we can't really access them. They're heavy in textiles. But they're really good producers for tiny little mom and pop shops. And what we experience is we can get some of the best leather products you've ever seen out of literally the mountainous jungles of Guatemala. But the one family that had six employees in the back of their you know house with a shop making this wonderful leather, they barely ever had a, a cell phone. You know, they definitely didn't have email, you know, like their place would get broken into and their tools stolen. And I'd hear from the two weeks later, hey, sorry, our cell phones and all of our drill presses got stolen. Like, we don't know what to do. And it was extremely, extremely difficult. So from the Guatemala perspective, I told everybody about the only products we could get were wood, leather, ceramic, textiles and coffee. Because some of the best coffee in the world comes from Latin America. Right. So what I'd like for you to do is refute that. Like, tell me, hey, Tim, it's not just those products like maybe in Guatemala. Yes. But in Central America, generally, there are a lot of other product categories. And maybe this is how we should go about finding. You've already mentioned like auto parts. Auto parts are very meticulously machined products. And I didn't mention steel products in Guatemala. So tell us as a general like Latin American ecosystem, what type of product should we be looking for? And what are some of the surprising products we can get there? Yeah, I agree with you that uh, those are the most uh, kind of products that are available in those areas. Because um, I, I think I talk about this with you in there is they are used to just serve their own um markets you know what i'm saying so if for example costa rica it's a four million people uh population so you don't need to do like big stuff you know even though there is a lot of big companies that they have their manufacturer uh ma manufacturing process in costa rica so because of the labor and other stuff but that uh that's different cases but textiles for sure like i believe guatemala is one of the best in 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 some stuff el salvador too um in in mexico i think they are a little bit more advanced because they are they are near to the us and they are like waking up to that they are understanding that there is a bigger need you know and so it's 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 good for, for them because um they are trying to understand for example how amazon works now they didn't know nothing about uh that and now they have for example amazon on mexico the portal in mexico so that's opening uh their minds to understand how it does how that that works so they can sell in the in the amazon side too uh, of, of the United States. So it's almost like a lot of these, and, and I agree with you, and I'm going to word it a little bit differently, but for so long, commerce through artisans, through manufacturers was low volume because they were essentially serving their community, right? Like like I could go to Panahachel, Guatemala, and there's some beautiful leather workers there. And for 200 years, these families have been making leather products just for tourists. The few people that showed up in the market are the local economy, right? So now the, the dynamics have shifted drastically where we can sell across borders. We have global demand. You know, we have huge brands looking for manufacturers and places like this and the manufacturer having a hard time catching up to the realization of that. Like, so, so it's going to take them a long time to build up their infrastructure, to build up their capabilities, to get more equipment, more, uh, shop space, more labor, uh, cheaper and, and, uh, I guess more highly regulated, uh, raw materials. But what you're saying is Mexico, is at the forefront of that? Would that be an accurate statement? Because maybe they're proximity to the U.S. and they just have a larger, um, you know, economy in general. Like they're a little bit more advanced in their manufacturing capabilities. Is that right? Yeah, and like you say, also um, one of the advantages of, of, for example, Mexico or, or the entire like Latin America, it's is it the shipping of the product. Like you can do it by ground. So that adds uh, a little value to all this because from China, you have to, uh, when it's big stuff or you want to save more money, you have to ship it by, uh, by sea, right? So I think that's one of the good things for the sellers because that in leading times, it's going to be less. It's always going to be less. And also on the taxes side, um, most of the products in, in made in Mexico, for example, 
don't pay like the taxes that are usually uh, paying for for China. Yeah, I agree with you with with shorter lead times. And listen, I, I've been to China dozens of times, I'm sure. But that's a brutal flight. 16 hours, you've got jet lag. But I could be in Mexico or Central America from the Dallas airport in like an hour or an hour and 40 minutes or two hours, right? So it makes it a lot easier. So I think there are a lot of huge advantages to sourcing in Latin America, especially Central America and Mexico, right? And I think that all this is coming together where these manufacturers are starting to realize like, hey, there's a bigger opportunity. And that's why I think there's so much demand. You know, you put out one Google ad, you know, Mexico is the new China and like everybody blew you up. So what about South America? You know, Latin America is um, generally, you know, like us gringos seen as Mexico and maybe Central America, right? Um, and let me also say say this. Let me get on my soapbox for a second. I was corrected once. I was in Guatemala and I was with um, uh, some folks and I said something about when I get back to America. And they looked at me and they said, what do you mean when you get back to America? And I'm like, when I get back to America. And they're like, we're Americans. I'm like, oh, you're citizens? And they're like, of course we're citizens. We're Americans. And I was like, looking at it funny, they said, in, in not so kind words, you stinking gringos. You think you have it all figured out. They're like, what region are we in? And I'm like, Central America? They're like, yeah, idiot, America. Like, South America is America. And I was like, holy crap. Like, we're all Americans. And I started thinking, I was like, all right, so if you're from Guatemala, you're Guatemalan. If you're from Costa Rica, you're Costa Rican. If you're from Brazil, you're Brazilian. But what if you're from the U.S.? Do you call ourselves U.S.ians? You can't call us Americans because we're all Americans. And that's when I realized the word gringo. Like, oh my goodness, this is a, like this is why this crazy word had to be invented because you couldn't call us a U.S.ian. Like, and it's too long to say a U.S. citizen. That's a pain in the butt, you know. So. Um, just a little level setting. I want everybody to understand that I have been educated that the entire, essentially the entire Western hemisphere is Americans. Doesn't make me any less patriotic. I'm just better educated now. So um, when we're looking at other other Latin American uh, cultures, we've talked, or, or regions, we've talked about Central America, we've talked about Mexico. What about South America? Explain to me where you think South America fits into this whole puzzle of you know, we're, we're private label sellers for brand owners we want to source. You know, uh, I believe in, in, for example, in Colombia, there's a lot of good manufacturers also for textiles and, and um, all this handcraft stuff. It, they are very good on that too. Um, Argentina too. Um, I, I can tell that Brazil, it's something that we're trying to figure out, um, not just because they, they speak Portuguese, so it's it's a little kind bit of, of a like, language barrier there, yeah. Yeah, but um, they do a lot of technology stuff. So um, we start like digging on that uh, market because we didn't uh, find nothing in in properly in in Mexico or the the other countries that you already mentioned. But everything that it's like headphones and things like that everything comes from china right and and we start like realizing that in brazil they have good technology and they're doing great stuff we just didn't know that um because they have their own it's the same thing it's a big population so they have their own uh cost, um customers and they serve uh brazil properly um they're now to work uh, for the other countries in some stuff because I've been seeing like for machines for agriculture or things like that are made in Brazil, like uh, parts, uh, auto parts too are made in Brazil, uh, buses, uh, things like that, uh, vehicles. So, so I think they, they are, there's a good opportunity to, to see that and, and dig more into that market for all the electronics that we are used to get from China, but now we can get them from from Brazil. So I I, I think it, it's a it's a good opportunity now to to start doing that with the situation with China and everything. Yeah. So do you think that Brazil is a little more advanced on the tech production side just because they're larger, just the scale of the country? There's more consumer, there's more demand, so they just started building this internally. I ask this because I have never heard anybody talk about Brazil as a production country. But it makes sense because they're huge, right? Like their economy is stable. They're like, uh, well, 
at least what I mean, their, their economy is, um, what you're looking for, uh, stable is in it's continuously growing, right? Like it's definitely not Venezuela, which is, <laughs> you know, kind of falling apart right now. So if I'm looking at having something manufactured in Brazil versus Mexico, is the big difference going to be availability for me? Like it's quicker to ship from Mexico. I can go down and see my manufacturers in Mexico. Like, so does Mexico probably pose the best opportunity overall for manufacturing in all of Latin America? Is that a fair statement? Uh, I believe right now Mexico, because of the th two things that we just mentioned is like the proximity to the U.S. That's, that's something that is really good. I don't know exactly how it worked, the, the taxes from Brazil to the U.S. So that's something that um, it's important to know. Um, but I believe Mexico right now doesn't have like the type of products that I've been researching in, in Brazil. And the only thing that it's, it's been hard for me, it, like I said, is just the language barrier. I understand a little bit, but the language barrier, it's a problem to ask the right questions or to the right people. You know, I need to use someone that translate everything for me. But I think Brazil, uh, there is a, a area called Manaus, uh, and, and you can Google it. And, and they have like many, many stuff and they, the technology and the manufacturers that they have there is, it's kind of interesting. And, and it's a very poor, poor uh, place as I heard, but they have a lot of manufacturers there. Gotcha. So let's say someone finds, you know, a product that is applicable to having manufactured somewhere in Latin America, you know, and, and let's assume that we're talking about Mexico or Central America, because I think that for most U.S. gringos, essentially most gringo buyers, that's going to be more applicable for sourcing. One of the biggest problems that I saw when I wanted to, to create a solution, you know, for sourcing was, you know, the communication is, is tough and, uh, you know, there's not like a really big directory to find these manufacturers. But the other problem that I saw that was massive and that I want to hit on is um, culture. All right. Like, how do we get over this cultural divide? And I'll tell you my experiences and you can tell me if I'm right or not and then maybe expand on it. But I'm going to make some some kind of presumptive statements as well. Most of Latin America, as it pertains to Central America especially, is very poor, right? I started going down to Honduras uh, shortly after college and on these home building trips. Like we go and we would literally build houses. Like we would build a wooden house in one day for a family of seven that that morning was living at the landfill, right? And they'd have this shack that was built out of old pallets and an old, um, billboard canvas and like they've got their two-year-old kids living in here you know so what we would do is we'd go down we'd build these houses spend a couple weeks in the summer and it really brought my attention to like how close you know these these regions are to us you know with these this great wealth that we have in the U.S. and like they are they're raising children on one meal a day you know almost in middle class situations it's very very sad and and, you know, I've told people on the, the podcast for you, like I've spent time in other third world countries, Haiti and places like that. But when I wanted to start making a difference in Central America, and I thought, man, I have this incredible opportunity to source products there. My thought has always been that, that capitalism can pull people out of generational, like, poverty, right? You can, you can give somebody a handout, you can give them a, a, a giveaway, but if you create jobs, it starts this systemic increase of generational wealth, which is how you pull a country from third world up, right? So I thought this would be easy. We're going to go down here. We're going to find these wonderful artisans and we're going to connect grants to them. It's great. But I'll tell you, the biggest struggle I had was nobody trusts the gringos. I mean, like the level of trust was almost non-existent. And I started like doing my research and I started asking successful business owners in Central America, like what's going on? And they just laughed at me like nobody trusts the gringos because Gringos have essentially taken advantage of our manufacturing for years. They don't respect the culture. And I'm, I'm making generalized statements, you know, just so nobody gets all, you know, the paintings and what. But generally, nobody respects the culture um, and everybody wants to exploit it. So they expect to come down and, and set up a, a sweatshop, essentially, in somewhere like Honduras or Nicaragua and get stuff built for next to nothing because they're desperate. Like manufacturers will take on projects 
that they can't afford to take on because it puts food on their table tonight. Right. And, and it's and it's awful. So what people were telling me would happen, what I later saw was like manufacturers that get an invitation. Hey, we want you to, to potentially build this product. Can you make a sample? They would bid half of what they should have because they wanted that job so bad. They wanted that 500 units, that thousand units. And because maybe they had never done large scale, they didn't know how fast it can scale up or they need they need to scale up. They didn't realize like what kind of expectations for speed and delivery that the buyers would have. And they would royally screw themselves. So they'd underbid, they'd push, they'd buy equipment, they'd bring in new labor. And at the end of the job, there's no other return orders for three months. They've got to lay back off their staff. They didn't make a single dime. In fact, they probably overextended themselves because they got excited. Right. I saw that. Or I saw stories of that happening time after time after time. So when I set up a company down there, my goal was to play intermediary. It was managed by local citizens that knew both sides and they would represent and protect the supplier, the manufacturer, just as much as they would the brand owner. And there were times when brand owners would come and say, oh, I think I can get this made for two bucks. I'd talk to supplier, they'd say, yeah, we can make it for two bucks. And I'd say, well, let's talk about that. And they'd walk me through and I'd say, dude, I don't think you're going to make any money at two bucks, but I bet if we sold that, you know, like sold this to the client at four, they'd be happy. So I'd go back to client and say, listen, I know you're going to sell this thing for 35. They'll accept the order for two bucks a unit, but they're not going to be able to do a repeat order because they're going to be out of business. Can you go with four? And they'd say, sure, we can go with four. It's still a great deal. And, and everybody's happy. But that wasn't scalable. And it was it was really tough to do. So my understanding, Susanna, to, to, to shorten that story was that there has to be a great deal of trust to move forward with a good business relationship sourcing from a, a, a Latin American supplier. Do you think that's accurate? And if so, how do you think that someone listening to this podcast, someone that has a beautiful wooden home decor product they want manufactured in Argentina, how do we go about doing that in a way that's respectful, that we're taking seriously, and that doesn't necessarily exploit or, or diminish the value of those suppliers where we can build this trust and long-term relationship and start fixing some of the damage that unfortunately few generations prior have, have created? Well, uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's a, it's a matter of trust because they they don't trust in 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 gringos like you said. Uh, because of that, because they try to and like I said, is is not general. There's people that is not doing that, but there's a lot of people that go to to those countries and find these people because they are not in yellow pages. They are they don't have websites like you said. They don't even have a phone sometimes, but they're doing this uh, um, handcraft uh, products in their homes. And, and they go there and they see the quality. They say, it's a good quality. It's perfect. It's nice. It's, it's well done. But they want to pay less because they think, oh, um, it's okay. If, if they offer for two, I, I'm going to tell them that I, we're, I'm going to buy them like 5,000 units in three months. So it, it's fine. I'm going to pay them the half. So it, how to rebuild that? It, it's, I think it's, it's a little bit hard. It's a little bit hard because you have to teach them both, both sides, you know, they, the the people in this this countries need to understand how the game is but if they don't they don't even know they don't even know how to sell it mostly what they do is they take that from their houses and they uh they take that to the town yeah, let's to the, say to the local market. they sell it to tourism yep. yeah they sell it to tourism so uh, and, and i get um uh, a, a story of a guy that once one day uh, he told me, "Can you find me ashtrays with with the shape of a a Mexican hat?" And I say yes. And when I came up with the price, I found like four different um, people that they were doing that. And he told me, "Oh no no no, that's too expensive." And I say why? And he say because when I go on vacation. I see that that's for 20 pesos, you know, and they're charging 50 right now. And I say, yes, but do you realize that it's hand painted, for example? And, and this is serving uh, a lot of, uh, of people. It's, it's, it's an entire family. And they, 
I want I want to make sure that they make good money on this because they're going to be able to do it again for you. And I know you're not going to sell it for one dollar, you know, or two dollars. So I, I think it's it's we need to um, educate both parts to make that happen. A, a respectful way to treat one and the other and, and build that trust in that way. You know, I'm going to buy what you have, but I will respect your price because it is, it is the way it is their work. You know, it is what they do every day with their hands. They put all the, all the time on that. And that's, that's something that probably is going to differentiate China from a country like Mexico or Guatemala or whatever. They're not doing 5,000 units at the same time. It's not a machine. It's people doing it, you know? So you have to take uh, that in mind and understand that it takes time for them to do it. it, it it's labor. It's not a machine. So you need to pay for that. So it's important that people understand it, it doesn't matter the country they are uh, from, but they need to understand that these people is doing this like manually and in other products, I know there's machines and stuff, but it, it, it's a whole different process. Also, uh, we, we don't want slavery in, in, in our country. So you are a proud Latina woman. I get that. You also understand the mind of a brand owner in the U S like you've represented both sides multiple, multiple times. So, being a proud Latina woman that understands manufacturing and that loves, you know, the Latin American culture and understands the pain points of, um, you know, the producers, you right now are speaking to tens of thousands of potential brand owners. Educate us. Like if you could sit in a conference room with 5,000 brand owners right now and you stood on the stage and you were going to educate us on something that we get wrong right? Like that we're doing this wrong. We're communicating this wrong. We, we have the wrong expectations and you want to educate us so that we can start building relationships and start bringing manufacturing to Central America, to Latin America, to Mexico. Like what's the most important thing that, that if you could stand on that stage and scream at us, like what would be that lesson? The first thing is be patient. Most of the people tell me all the time, Susana, I want this, but I want it now. And I know they are used to the Chinese that in in two hours, they have all the uh, all the quotes and everything, the quotations and whatever, the everything. They know everything in, in two days, in, you know? But you guys need to understand that, for example, when it's a new product from them, because let's say it's a person that do, um, I mean, a manufacturer that do wood stuff, you know, like chairs or tables or whatever. That's what they used to do. They're not used to do anything else. So if you go there and you see that they do beautiful chairs and you want them to make a desk, they need time. You know, they, they need time because they need to figure it out, like the entire process, uh, how much time is going to take this and this and how many people is going to take. So be patient. That's the first thing. Once you have the first, it will go smooth. I believe it's, it's going to go smooth because on the cases that I've been seeing, like I have one on the top of my mind with something in wood, they probably, they, they never did that. And I realized that <laughs> they never did that, but they are open to do things and they are open to do new things. So it's good. You can make them sign an NDA or whatever. It's fine, but they will take some time to get it done the right way because they can probably deliver something just for the liver like it happens in china and you guys know this they can send you a sample the sample is perfect but then but then when they send the entire thing the entire uh, production is not what you were expecting so now you get reviews from your customers oh this was not okay this was defective la 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 so Patience is one of the things that um, you guys need to learn if it's going to be this, the first product. Yeah. And let me expand on that. And you be thinking about your second point while I'm doing this. But I noticed that 
it, nobody's going to give you a price until they figure out exactly how long it takes to make something. And they have to make it to figure out the time. So I would send pictures. I, I would literally send Pinterest pictures. Hey, see if you can make this. And they would go through round after round after round. Hey, is this close? Yeah, but shave a little off here. Build this out a little bit. Do the, you know. And they would literally have to make several of them before they felt comfortable even giving me a quote. And here's the thing. These are like family manufacturers. Like they're already busy. They can't stop everything they're doing and turn into a prototype warehouse. So a lot of times what would happen is they're working like nights. Like when the shop would shut down for the night, an employee would stay there and make me a sample. Right. And um, after they made three or four samples, they would have an idea of what it would cost and how, you know, their man hours. Then you cool. But usually that process took at least a week and a half, sometimes two weeks. Now, does it suck to wait two weeks to get a quote or to even find out, hey, we can't do this? Yeah, it sucks. But it's worth it, in my opinion, because for the right products, like sourcing those products, one, that you can tell a story with, right? And two, that is handmade, not like not mass produced. And when I say handmade, it doesn't mean it's not hand produced or mass produced. See, everybody thinks when we say handmade, we think, oh, like two or three units. No, I've been in places in Central America. I've been in places in India where products are being handmade, but there's 50 people in line making them and they're all perfectly identical. They're perfect matches. You want to order 5,000 units of a handmade product? Perfect. You can actually get most of those made the exact same way. Like you have to do your due diligence. You have to make sure that, you know, your, your uh, purchase order is the same. You've got the, all the details, you know, you've got to like set expectations. But just to level set, when we say handmade, we don't mean only small batches. We can do massive batches of handmade stuff. So my point is, like, and, and really just to, to build on Susanna's point, like patience sometimes is hard, but patience is usually worth it. And in my experience dealing, especially in Central America, is when I had patience, I was showing them respect. I was showing these manufacturers, I'm not going to be a giant pain in the butt to work with. I understand it takes you some time. To me, it's worth it to wait on your samples because I'm going to value your samples and value your price because I'm already valuing you as a manufacturer. And if you're crawling up their butt, speed up, speed up. Why don't I have this? Oh, it's been four days. Why don't I have the price? At? That's not how you get this thing started, right? And even patience in manufacturing, because here's the thing. The environment is not always super stable. I'll give you an example. We were dealing with a manufacturer in Antigua, Guatemala, or right outside of Antigua. And this was uh, a one-man shop. It Well, essentially, a one-family shop. It was a father and a son and, like, a few cousin employees. And, uh, you know, a lot of these employees were extremely poor. Like, when I say, you know, they're lucky to give, you know, one meal to a child a day, like, that's not an exaggeration, folks. Like, this is – some of these situations are really, really bad. And we sent money down for an initial, initial order, you know, initial, uh, like, order placement. And that money was going to go towards raw materials. So the dad gives one of the nephews who's working for them the cash to go buy lumber in their old beat up 1984 Toyota Tacoma pickup truck. And the employee never showed up. He literally took the $200 in cash or $300. I don't even, I have no idea what it was, but the money to buy the lumber and he stole the truck and dude hightailed it out of there. And last I heard, Dude was making for the U.S. border. He had a truck. He had gas money, and he was headed to Mexico. He was headed. Does that piss me off? Yeah, it pisses me off because now they're asking for more money. Like, can we get another advance? Because I got to buy this. And by the way, like, we don't have a truck anymore for the family, and I don't know how we're going to get raw materials. And like, this sucks. If I don't have the patience to put my, you know, feet in their shoes and realize, like, that is one of the worst days of this manufacturer's life you know like now he has seven employees standing around waiting for lumber that doesn't show up he just got his truck stolen he's got a family member that stole from him there's a whole lot of drama there. and of course i'm telling you like the most extreme scenario i'm not saying that every manufacturer is like this but like but these things happen right and if we don't have patience and understand that like some people just have bad days and like things work a little bit slower and you know there's not 18 wheelers of of you know, glass and plastic pellets pulling up in the injection molding, you know, factory in China, it's different. But if we have patience and if we give a little bit of slack, we can end up with some of the most unique, beautiful, well-made, pridefully built products that you're going to find anywhere else in the world. But it doesn't happen instantly. You know, your first order is going to be 10,000 units. You've got to invest time and energy and emotion with these 
producers for them to start trusting you and they'll start investing in you at that point. And then you build these beautiful long-term relationships, but it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, you can start with one product. And then if the relationship goes well, you can ask them to make, you know, whatever you want. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. And, and don't get us wrong guys, but, um, like, it's not that everything is going to be like that. You know, there is more manufacturers there that are like more experienced, but at the end of the day, even if they have more experience, they have experience on some products. So if the product it's already like, uh, being produced, it's going to be faster. But if it's not, if it's something that you want to guys like build new, new things or whatever, um, that will take time. On some other products like backpacks or things like that, I, I find like very, very good quality and they do it fast because they are, they are doing that already. But if you want to tweak it or do different stuff, then you have to be patient for, for, uh, for those type of things. When, when you change something in the product, there is normally in private labeling, um, that you change some stuff, uh, it, it's. It is, it takes time when it's like fully done It's the same thing. It's just like a very good quality with the example that I just gave, uh, the backpacks, for example, it's like, it's like that it's, it's going to be fast and they can give you the, the price right away. It's not going to be problem, but with the rest, I, I just can suggest patient and, and also knowing that, um, well, now for COVID, it, it's, it's a little complicated, but then it, you are like two hours, like team said, two hours away, one hour away, three hours away. I don't know. It's, it's so, um, so near that you can go and check them out and talk to them and, and see, uh, what they do, how they do it. So it, it, it's, it's good for that. I mean, for, to build that relationship with so, them too. So lesson number one, if you could stand on the stage and scream at everybody is have patience. What's your second lesson? Learn to ha how to speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're saying that directly to me. Is this an accusation that you're making towards me right now? So you you know that I've been trying to tell you that this is important. Why is it important? What I'm saying is at least just try to say some stuff because it shows that you care, you know, because sometimes if, if someone is going to be in the middle making all, all the translation, that helps a lot with the trust too, because you can trust in the manufacturer, but if you have something in the middle, what's going to happen, you know, like, so try to understand, like at least understand or, 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 um, if it's something that you really want to do, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so, so I could almost translate this to like invest in the cause. Like if you're going to start potentially sourcing in like Latin America, like learn a little bit of Spanish, gain some rapport. Um, I would even probably extend that. And I assume you agree with me to like start understanding the culture a little bit more because, and I know this because it happened to me. Like when I showed enough respect to these manufacturers like that I would learn a few words of Spanish or I would, you know, build rapport with them. Like that went two ways. And one thing that I noticed is, and I, I'm almost ashamed that we've done that is like, I don't want to represent Latin America as third world countries. It's not all third world country. There are, there's definitely much more poverty, you know, especially in like Central America and especially now like Venezuela. But even though the economies are not as, you know, awesome as, uh, you know, the U.S. economy or, or a lot of, you know, the Chinese economy or a lot of European uh, economies. And things are less progressed as far as infrastructure. And, you know, there are still totalitarian governments and there's still, um, you know, some bad stuff. The truth is the Latin culture is very prideful, right? Like when, when a man dresses up to go to work, he may be making $3 a day walking to work with no soles on his shoes, but by God, that dude has his shirt clean and pressed if he can and like, you know, wearing the best, best pair of pants he's got. So there is definitely a pride to that culture. And I guess to your point, Susanna, like if I'm wanting to deal with 
um, Latin American producers, like I have to respect that. I have to respect their culture. I have to respect their pride. I have to show them some respect. You know, I can't come in with a cowboy, you know, smoking a cigar, acting cool, you know, talking down my nose to people because that is the last thing in the world that you need to do if you want to actually have a relationship. So don't equate like the level of uh, available pride or pomp like with how much money you make as a manufacturer or as a, as a brand owner. You're talking to a manufacturer that's by most worldly standards fairly poor, like because that's not going to get you anywhere. Like show some respect. Um, be a decent human being, uh, show some love, let them have some pride. And like, that's how you make incredible relationships with these manufacturers that will end up making everybody a lot of money and, and potentially making you hugely successful. Is that right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and also if you build like, for example, with those small manufacturers, if you build that relationship with them, they're going to invite you to the to their houses they're going to do food i make i mean make food for you we're very warm we're very welcome but also yeah probably we're a little bit afraid of if they want something for me or for me or what or you know a apprehensive it, 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 yeah that that's true but once we get it yeah you know like we trust people is like that. We're warm. We're, we welcome people uh, to our countries and, and, and to buy from us. And, and, and that's kind, kind of, that's my mission, like right now. Like I'm, make people understand that we can do some good stuff in Latin America, that we, we want to welcome everybody to, to know the country, to know what we can do. Cause it doesn't mean that if we are not in in online or in websites or in e-commerce right now, that doesn't mean that we can do good stuff and, and really good stuff. Because you can go here in, in the United States and you can just see in some apparel or shoes or things like that, and you will see the name of Latin America all over. So that means something, you know, that's what people are buying, That that type of quality it is what i'm saying so um yeah learn some <laughs> learn some english i mean some spanish because in some cases they know i mean they speak uh english for example in costa rica there is a lot of people that speak uh english so that's good in mexico in some regions in, in, for example in, in mexico city a lot of people speak speak in english but I'm, we're talking, I guess, team in, in some of other regions that are like a little bit far from, from cities, you know, uh, but there's a lot of manufacturers in those areas for incredible products. It's been interesting working with you. And I know that uh, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag yet, but you and I are working on some pretty cool stuff, <laughs> cool stuff right now. And um, you've been able to source some, uh, some of my ongoing products uh, in Mexico for me, which I was never able to do in the past. And, um, really cool stuff. And I uh, appreciate your willingness to share some information and, and share some some wisdom and, and be honest about, you know, some of the stuff that maybe a lot of people don't want to talk about when it comes to sourcing in Latin America. I think that five years from now, you and I are going to look back on this interview and realize like how elementary this content was, because I think in five years from now, the level of access and content and understanding and products that are being made in Latin America is going to 10x at least. And I think that it's going to be mainstream. I think everybody's going to be doing everything going to be talking about it. I can't wait to see that happen. I hope that we get in the, the forefront of that would be awesome. Um, so thank you for sharing. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, um, how could they do that? And let me say this to all of you that are listening going, oh, I got the perfect product. There are not many Susannas out there right? You don't have a lot of options as far as people that you can contact to, to let you into the network of producers that she has, right? And once this episode drops, there's going to be a lot of people calling you Susanna. So all of you that are listening, please have some patience and don't beat her up too bad because she's going to get a thousand emails on the first day that this thing drops and it's going to be crazy. And the truth is, there's a lot of you that have product ideas that just are not good fits for, Central, or for Latin America in general. Like there are people that have something like, oh, you know, no import duties, you know, truck it across the board is going to be great. And, and there are still, I'd say the majority of the products made in this world that are just better in Asia. They just are. They just fit better. 
Um, maybe in the next 10 years, that'll change. Uh, so, so we're not here by any means preaching the, the virtues of Latin America as a complete replacement for every other sourcing option out there. Um, that's not going to happen for a decade or more, at least, if at all. But for the right products and the right willingness to build the relationships and the right willingness to explore opportunities and the right willingness to um, show respect and show patience and show creativity, Latin America is by far the most underrated and well-kept secret in manufacturing in the world by far. So Susanna, how do we get in touch with you? Now that I've basically warned everybody to, to not get mad at you and it takes you out of spawn, but how do, we, uh, how do we get in contact with you if we have a product we think would be good for Latin America and maybe you can help us find that supplier? Yeah, it could be uh, through, the, through my email. Uh, it's manufacturersuppliersllc at gmail.com. And also on my social media, it's Coach Susana Vida. Sorry, it's in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you that have no idea what she just said, look in the show notes. You'll see them in the show notes. Uh, we've got all that written there. You can track her down. So thank you, Susanna. We're at like the 50-minute mark, and the editors are going to tell us to shut up and get out of here. But you want to share one more, one more word of wisdom before we sign off? It's got to be short, though. I just uh, want to thank you, team, again. And thank you, all the people that is listening or listening or watching. Um, for sure, uh, pretty exciting things are coming uh, for, for both uh, markets, for sellers and for manufacturers. And I promise you guys that we have our hands on that. And it's going to be pretty exciting for everybody. <laughs> it's going to be a bomb. <laughs> but you can guys uh uh for, i mean for now it's it's just about that patient and and try to build that relationship with with the people or the manufacturers and i'm here to help anything that i can uh, do for you guys uh really i'm here just uh, it doesn't have to be about sourcing or anything but any advice or how to appro approach or uh, the manufacturers or, or whatever, I'm here to to help. Awesome. Thank you, Susanna, for being on. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for listening. If you like this content, make sure you leave a good review on whatever podcast platform you're, uh, you're listening on. Give us a like, give us a thumbs up, give us a, uh, a subscribe button smash if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you all for being part of this episode, and we'll see you guys on the next one.